This week we shift our attention away from social policy to talk about economic policy and how Canada's economic union has evolved over time. As you know, um, tying together a common market was an important objective of Confederation in 1867 and over time certain tensions have developed alongside several institutions to try to develop, cultivate and in some ways improve Canada's economic union. That's what we'll talk about today. So our objectives are similar to what we had with the social union. We'll talk about what is the economic union uh, and how it has evolved over time. And again, I'll leave it to your discretion to come up with uh, some of the positives and negatives of this particular uh, ev evolution. The economic union was at the heart of the Confederation deal in 1867. Uh, the idea of creating a, some kind of a common market to allow for the free flow of goods, uh, services, and later uh, labor, uh, and capital was an important one for, for the colonists that first came together in, in, in 1867. The idea of integrating all of those colonial economies into a single market would allow them to combine their, their bargaining power, would allow them to share costs and to share risks um, that they themselves uh, would find difficult and had found difficult to bear on their own. And this whole idea of creating an economic union was really at, at the, was a cornerstone of the first government, uh, federal government in Canada, Johnny MacDonald and the Conservatives, and their uh, first national policy. And the first national policy was really a protectionist uh, set of protectionist measures, one that uh, would involve erecting high tariff barriers, in other words, uh, protecting uh, those uh, nascent industries in central Canada, in particular manufacturing, uh, from foreign competition. Uh, by erecting high tariff barriers that would make uh, importing goods from other countries, in particular Britain and the United States, m um, more expensive and that thus create a, uh, a stronger market internally for, for Canada's own goods. At the same time, building a continental railway was an important part of the first national policy and one that was really a, a deal maker for folks in British Columbia and in Atlantic Canada. Along with that, the notion that the Hudson's Bay Company lands in what is now um, northern Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta would be used uh, to the benefit of, of, the whole, of the whole new country. And this is one of the reasons why even when they were given uh, provincial status beginning in the late 19th century, sorry, in the beginning of the late 19th century, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta did not gain full control over their natural resources until decades later um, because the federal government would retain control over them uh, in, in order to reap the full benefits of those natural resources for the entire country. And together, this, th those factors of creating a protectionist policy um, to, to the, uh, and, and controlling Western lands was really what drove um, the first sense of Western alienation. Uh, in, in what's now Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. The high railway and freight rates uh, had created uh, real barriers to economic development for farmers in, in those provinces. The tariff barriers themselves had made, uh, made it more difficult for them to uh, compete with, uh, with their farming neighbors in, in the United States where farm implements were much cheaper, but of course they didn't have access to those cheaper American farm implements because of the high tariff barriers. And lastly, of course, the idea that natural resources would belong to uh, the federal government as opposed to those provinces was a major irritant for, for folks in, in Western Canada and really demonstrates the extent to which regional tensions have been uh, tearing at, at uh, the fabric of Canada's economic union from the beginning. Indeed, the first national policy gave way to a series of regional or provincial policies uh, throughout the post-war period, to the point that by 1980, the federal government uh, decided it was time to call a royal commission into the matter, and the Macdonald Commission, uh, as it was known, uh, reached the conclusion that there were many uh, internal trade barriers uh, that were impeding the development of Canada's economic union. And this prompted... Uh, uh, as we'll discuss, this prompted many um, governments to work together to try to, to, uh, to, to lower some of those internal trade barriers, particularly uh, in the 1990s when uh, the combination of globalization and neoliberalism had, had begin take, begun taking root in Canada as it was throughout much of the Western world. Um, Canadian governments 
and, and businesses. We're pushing for Canadian uh, for the Canadian economy to become more competitive, and we're encouraging all governments uh, to collaborate with one another in order to achieve that. When the federal government began signing uh, free trade agreements, first with the United States and then the United States and Mexico and then elsewhere, um, it really highlighted for many folks here in Canada the irony that while trade barriers were falling between Canada and its international partners, there still remained many internal trade barriers between provinces uh, that, that many thought were impeding Canada's economic development. So after Canada signed NAFTA with the United States, we began to see the development of the Agreement on Internal Trade, uh, or the AIT within Canada. And some regional equivalents also developed with TILMA, Trade Investment Labour Market uh, Agreement between um, Alberta and BC, which has now become the new US Partnership Agreement uh, in between uh, BC, Alberta, and Saskatchewan. Which brings us to today, and again, these regionalist tensions have not uh, subsided. In fact, uh, many would argue that, that they persist or even become stronger over time. Um, those of you that can remember back to uh, 2011 uh, federal election, may remember calls for uh, calls by some official opposition leaders to um, address Canada's Dutch disease, and, uh, which was a, a, a veiled um, attempt to uh, pin Ontario's manufacturing decline on um, increased uh, natural resource wealth in Western Canada. Now, Dutch disease uh, is a situation where the export of a, a particular country's raw or natural resources um, coincides with rising commodity prices, and that helps to inflate the country's uh, currency. And that it itself is a detriment to uh, export sectors, including here in Canada, the manufacturing sector. The term was originally uh, devised to describe the situation that happened in the Netherlands in the 1970s. But as I say, it, it, it raised its head again uh, when uh, leaders from central Canada uh, held that uh, the economic decline in their region was due to increased commodity prices in um, in, in, in the Alberta oil sands, but also in Western Canada in general. Another area of tension in Canada's economic union today surrounds the idea of securities regulation. And for just over a century, Canada's securities uh, regulation, in other words, the regulation of capital markets and so on, has been conducted at the provincial level. Uh, and this makes Canada unique among any modern federations, in, in, among the Western world, really, for not having a single national securities regulator. Instead, uh, Canada's system runs on a, a series of 13 uh, provincial and territorial uh, securities regulators that are stitched together through what's known as a passport system, where when a company or, or individual is, is approved um, by one jurisdiction, they're approved by, by all. In other words, they give a passport to the entire Canadian system. Now, many economists and many in uh, central Canada and, and the federal government felt that this system uh, was inadequate and that it needed to be addressed. And in 2010, the uh, Conservative government in Ottawa uh, proposed to pass what was known as the Canada Securities Act and to establish a, a national regulator in, in Canada under federal jurisdiction. And while cooperative, it was still uh, established that the federal government has jurisdiction over uh, over, over securities regulation under the federal trade and commerce power in, in section 91. At the same time, the federal government did refer its own legislation to the Supreme Court of Canada. Many provinces have threatened to, to refer the legislation to their own uh, to their own courts, and the federal government beat them to it in that sense. The Supreme Court came back with a judgment against the the federal government, saying that securities regulation did fall under provincial jurisdiction, and that if the federal government did want to move forward with a national securities regulator, it would have to take a cooperative legislative approach with uh, with provinces that were willing to do so. And that's exactly what the federal government chose to do. Uh, in September of 2013, BC, Ontario, and the federal government announced uh, an agreement that would have them establish what was known as a cooperative capitals markets, capital markets regulator. Um, the agreement would allow any province that wanted to join to pass uniform provincial securities legislation uh, alongside some complementary federal legislation that would apply throughout Canada. 
this it hoped would help to shield uh, the participants from systemic risk and, and again allow Canada's economic union to um, uh, to, to, to grow uh, e even more. Uh, many provinces have not signed on to this aside from Ontario and BC and it may, remains to be seen um, whether the cooperative uh, capital markets regulator will withstand um, scrutiny um, in the courts if a province decides to take it to take it there. And lastly uh, another area of tension has been around the idea of, of labor market development which until recently uh, fell squarely under provincial jurisdiction as well. Um, beginning in the late 20th century, the federal government had begun devolving authority, uh, which was contested. The provinces have always contested that they had control under, over labor market development through, the trade, through their um, property and civil rights powers. Um, but the federal government did have a hand in it up until the late 1990s when they began devolving authority over to the provinces. Eventually through uh, the transferring of staff and, and resources, and now, as it currently stands, through the development of three separate funds, the LMDA, the LMA, and the LMAPD. And we'll walk through those, uh, through those acronyms uh, right now. The, LMA, sorry, the LMDA, the Labor Market Development Agreement, uh, sends funds to the provinces for those individuals uh, who are eligible for employment insurance uh, programs. So those folks that are eligible to receive training and, and uh, in some cases upgrading or otherwise being engaged in the labor market through EI, if you're eligible for EI benefits, you get funded through the LMDA. And to give you an example of how much money that is for the province of Alberta, it's just over $100 million a year that flows into um, provincial revenues from the federal government to fund those particular programs. So uh, the second uh, major labor market agreement uh, is the LMA, the labor market agreement, which flows again, just to give you an idea of scope, flows about 50 million dollars into Alberta um, per year. And this fund is designed to provide services for folks who are most vulnerable uh, when it comes to Securing a place in Canada's um, in, in, in place in Canada's economy through employment. So the LMA is used to fund folks who are not EI eligible, and again are some of the most vulnerable in, in Canadian society when it comes to landing a job and, and, and maintaining a, a place in Canada's economy. The third agreement, the LMAPD, is the Labour Market Agreement for Persons with Disabilities, and that flows, in Alberta's case, about $25 million per year into, into Alberta's uh, coffers, which, uh, as its name suggests, is, is earmarked for persons with disabilities. Now, the LMA and the LMAPD, uh, both of those funds were set to expire. Those agreements were set to expire in March of 2014, and the federal government announced that it was willing to uh, renegotiate those under new terms, and those new terms would involve ensuring that um, employers were involved in determining eligibility and the structure of, of the provincial labor market uh, programs, but also that there would be an increased amount of accountability for how the federal money that was flowing to the provinces was being spent. And as we've talked about in class, that raised the ire of many provincialists who, who felt that the federal government's um, flowing of funds should come with few if any conditions. At the same time the federal government also announced that it was wanting to renegotiate the LMDA, the Labour Market Development Agreement, the biggest one again to, um, to, to impose increased accountability on provinces for the spending of what the federal government saw as federal tax dollars. So as part of the 2013 federal budget, the federal government unilaterally proposed that 60% of the LMA funding uh, would be redirected to what it was calling the Canada Jobs Grant. And this uh, new Canada Jobs Grant would involve, it originally involve $5,000 being paid by employers, $5,000 by the province, and $5,000 by the federal government to upgrade folks uh, into new positions within the economy. As you can imagine, this drew the ire of, of provinces, many of whom thought that this was shifting um, funding away from the most vulnerable people in society and, and redirecting it towards folks who needed upgrading in particular 
um, people were suspicious that this was a means of reaching out to voters in southern Ontario who had lost their jobs uh, as part of the restructuring of that economy in the, in the aftermath of the 2008 uh, economic downturn. So at the 2013 uh, summer meeting of the Council of the Federation, Premiers unanimously expressed concerns about the new Canada Jobs Grant approach and asked two Premiers, Premier Alward from New Brunswick and Premier Clark from BC to lead some multilateral discussions with the federal government. And these negotiations uh, went through several rounds and by February of 2014 the federal government presented what it saw as its final proposal which provided some greater flexibility with regards to how the Canada Job Grant funding uh, could be uh, mobilized within 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 um, provin existing provincial programs and existing provincial funds and transfers, and it allowed provinces to protect up to 60% of the traditional uh, LMA funding, which was used to protect vulnerable folks, um, and agreed that uh, the negotiations would be ongoing and on a bilateral basis. And by February, the end of February 2014, premiers, with the exception of Quebec, had agreed in principle to the new federal approach. And we're currently in bilateral negotiations at this point with, with several uh, provinces um, having agreed in principle to a, a new bilateral deal that would allow uh, for this the establishment of, of the Canada Jobs Grant in, in their jurisdictions. It is worth noting that on the eve of the 2014 Quebec election, the federal government agreed to simply renew the existing Quebec labor market agreement, which uh, came to the surprise and, and in, in, some, in some cases the consternation of several provincial governments who were upset that the new agreement in Quebec uh, was imposing a different set of standards than the ones in the rest of Canada. It remains to be seen how all of these Canada Jobs Grant uh, deals and new labour market uh, agreements will, will roll out, um, but that's where we are uh, at, at present. So that's what we've done today. We've, we've talked about what is Canada's economic union, how has it evolved over time, and, why, and again, uh, with a special focus on, on some of the major regional tensions that have developed over time, beginning with Western alienation and now dealing with um, federal-provincial conflicts over things like securities, uh, regulation, and, and labor market development.